Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation. I'm Tammy Diedrich, the Managing Editor of IBM Systems Magazine, and I'm the moderator for this event. Today's webinar is sponsored by Throughput Manager and is titled ZOS Capping and Automation, What's in Your Toolbox? Our featured speakers today are John Baker and Selby Shanley. John Baker is a ZOS Performance Specialist with more than 20 years' experience as a user and consultant. He has assisted many of the world's largest data center customers with their ZOS performance challenges. John has held subject area chair positions with CMG and the, is a popular speaker at CMG, Share, and IBM conferences. Selby Shanley is the principal developer of Throughput Manager and is the resident subject matter expert. Selby is steeped in mainframe technology and is well known globally as a ZOS, JES2, and WLM expert. In this webinar, John and Selby will provide details on the use, functionality, and limitations in your free IBM toolkit for capping and automation, and the options you have to increase your savings and balance your workloads with Throughput Manager. Following the presentation, we will have a brief Q&A period, so please feel free to enter your questions in the question panel on your screen anytime during the presentation. And please make sure you address that to all panelists. Now, without further ado, thanks again for joining us today. And John, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Tammy. And thank you, everyone, for attending today. We all have our go-to tools. In our personal lives, most of us could not get by without our smartphones. In ZOS performance, we rely on RMF and similar tools. In the areas of automation and software costs, IBM includes a number of excellent tools with ZOS, we believe you should take full advantage of these tools, but we also believe more can be done. For our agenda today, we want to start off by showing just how important software costs are in the data center. We'll review subcapacity pricing, the rolling four-hour average, and the soft capping options provided by IBM. Then we'll discuss reducing demand. Consider that capping controls resource provisioning but subcapacity pricing is based on resource consumption. So to really reduce software costs, you need to reduce consumption. Now, Throughput Manager does this automatically with or without capping. We'll talk more about that later on. Now, software is easily the largest operating expense in the data center, and it's growing every year. While subcapacity pricing allows billing based on peak consumption, running without caps means a spike in the rolling four-hour average can lead to unacceptably high software bills. Caps provide the ability to control this cost, but at a price to performance. What's needed is a way to control the rolling four-hour average without the unwanted performance hit. Now first, let's review subcapacity pricing. Now, today's mainframes offer massive capacity. The new Z13 offers up to 141 processors, producing a staggering 13,000 MSUs in a single footprint. Given a business plan that may need a machine to last three or four years, a cautious capacity planner will acquire a larger machine to accommodate growth. Now, IBM obviously wants to keep your business, so rather than charge you for the entire capacity of the machine, we're charged based on usage, specifically, via the rolling four-hour average. Based on this consumption, the SCRT report tells IBM what tier your machine is at, which determines your invoice. The next slide illustrates a sample. Now this table was produced using sample data from multiple sites at varying capacity levels. IBM doesn't actually reveal pricing, so the values have been altered to protect the innocent. I can assure you, however, these ranges are representative of current workload license charges. On the left axis, we show the nine levels and their respective MSU ranges as provided by IBM. These numbers are readily available on the IBM subcapacity website. On the top axis, we show estimated costs for IBM's more common software, ZOS, DB2, etc. The tier MSU columns shows the total MSUs within each tier, and the tier rate column totals the cost for the five sample pieces of software listed. This is a typical software stack. 
the accumulated MLC cost multiplies these two numbers. Now, a key aspect of understanding subcapacity pricing is that whatever tier you are at, you pay for all the lower tiers. As you go down, or up may be more appropriate, through tiers with larger consumption, the costs are accumulated, as shown in the accumulated cost column. Now, the example shown below the table is for 1,000 MSUs of consumption, which totals well over $600,000 per month. So the bottom line here is we're talking about serious money, and every MSU counts. Now, I touched earlier on the rolling four-hour average, and this is a very important point to understand. Many are often misled about when their peaks occur, as well as which workloads contribute to those peaks. In this example, we can clearly see the highest peak of almost 450 MSUs occurred at 10 a.m. Now, this is the highest utilization peak, but it is not the highest average peak. The rolling four-hour average peak did not occur until 1230. And it's this peak that is the basis for your software charges. Now, calculating which workloads and when they contributed to this peak is no trivial task because you must consider all workloads which ran over the previous four hours, not just during that peak hour. Now, we've developed an analysis tool to calculate these values, and we'll get into that later. But for now, let's take a look at your basic tools. To assist with controlling software costs, IBM provides a number of capping options with ZOS. Most useful among these are the defined capacity and group capacity options. These may also be referred to as capacity limits or simply soft caps. IBM also provides, at no additional charge, the Capacity Provisioning Manager. While CPM has been around for a while, there are some great enhancements in ZOS 2.1 that Selby is going to cover a bit later. As I mentioned, caps are also referred to as capacity limits, and their primary purpose is to control monthly software charges by limiting the rolling four-hour average. Soft caps are a good choice because they only limit application consumption when the rolling four-hour average exceeds the cap level. In this example, the rolling four-hour average never exceeds the cap, so the demand is free to go as high as the machine can manage. Defined capacity was the first soft cap option IBM introduced several years ago. It was much more flexible than the initial hard cap option at the time. The limitation is that defined capacity only works on a single LPAR. IBM has since addressed that limitation with group capacity. Now, if you're going to soft cap, group capacity is simply the way to go. With a full CAC or CPC scope, one group capacity limit can control your software costs on the entire machine while maintaining the flexibility of sharing resources. You can also choose to create multiple capacity groups containing different LPARs on the same machine. These LPARs do not need to be in the same sysplex, and you may also combine individual defined capacity limits on specific LPARs where you may want to have a little more control. Now remember, our theme today is capping and automation. Now Selby's gonna go into a little more detail about the automation aspects of both group capacity and the capacity provisioning manager. Selby. On each LPAR in the group, WLM is monitoring the rolling four hour average of the group and the CPU usage of each LPAR. It continually recalculates the share of the limit for each LPAR in several stages. Let's step through it. First, WLM determines the share of the limit to which each LPAR is entitled by its weight as a percentage of the total weight of all the LPARs in the group. Second, it identifies those LPARs that need more than the share to which they are entitled, and also those LPARs that are not currently using all of their entitlement. WLM simply lowers the share for those LPARs that don't need it all and then divides this available capacity across the LPARs that do need more. This is a very familiar strategy called receiver donor, 
where CPU resource is moved to where it is needed. On each LPAR in the group, WLM sends a request to PRISM to change the limit for the local LPAR, the one on which it is running, and telling it to cap the LPAR. WLM tracks the CPU usage of the LPARs in the group and adjusts the individual limits constantly. Capacity groups are far from static. As the demands of each LPAR change, the limit for each LPAR is adjusted, making it truly dynamic. Throughput Manager takes advantage of this, as we'll discuss shortly. For those of you interested in the technical details, I highly recommend reading an IBM document on capping, part of IBM's Inside WLM series. The URL is on the slide. In this document, IBM developers explain how the capping limits are set for the individual members of the capacity group. There's lots of other good information on capping as well. We'll show the URL again on our final slide, so you'll have lots of time to copy it down. For some time, the capacity provisioning manager included with ZOS has been available from IBM to provide increased processor capacity using capacity on demand when criteria such as service class performance indicate that more capacity is required. With ZOS 2.1, IBM added the capability to have CPM adjust the defined capacity or group capacity. It's important to set defined capacity and group capacity limits so that you reduce the rolling 4-hour average as much as possible without adversely affecting the performance of key applications such as online. Starting with ZOS 2.1, CPM can be used to provide a safety valve should soft capping cause performance issues for critical applications. You can configure CPM to specify the conditions under which the defined capacity or group capacity limits should be increased, including the names of the service classes to be monitored, period importance level, and threshold performance index value, as well as a date time range and the days of the week. CPM will monitor one or more service class periods and increase the defined capacity or group capacity limits when it determines that the conditions set by the installation have been met and that the increase will actually help the performance of the service class or classes. This makes it possible to set a somewhat more aggressive, in other words, lower, limit than you otherwise might have done, which can result in a lower rolling four-hour average. John? Thanks, Elby. Now, just before we continue, I'm going to ask Jen to launch the first of two polls we have for you. Uh, this one is related to capping. Please be assured we're not going to share your answers with your competitors, so uh, feel free to weigh in. We'll leave the poll up for a little while to give everyone time to respond uh, while we continue with the presentation. So as you can tell, we're big fans of these IBM tools, but some shops have specific needs. We work with many customers who are so focused on performance and availability, the caps are a non-starter. The performance hit of hitting the wall is not an option for them. And while CPM can protect against that, higher cap limits mean higher software costs. Then there's the issue of the workloads themselves. I mentioned earlier the danger in confusing a burst peak with an average peak. We should also bear in mind that the workload that drives the peaks may be the highest contributor, but all workloads consume MSUs, and the cost is the same regardless of which application consumed them. Now, this is the primary reason that some choose not to cap. When the rolling four-hour average exceeds the cap limit, applications are immediately affected. When this occurs, the LPAR, a group of LPARs, is capped by PRISM. CPU resources are only provided to the LPAR at a rate that does not exceed the capacity limit, regardless of the actual application demand. The effect is very much as if the applications are suddenly running on a small machine. Further, the capping is going to re remain in place until the rolling four-hour average is back below the capacity limit. In this case, the effect remained for three hours. So what do we do when cap limits are exceeded? Well, first we panic. Then we turn to our monitors, figure out who's consuming the most CPU. We cancel jobs, uh, adjust priorities, and do our best to help our applications continue to perform in a more constrained environment. It requires a lot of expert staff, 
and with the extreme cost of downtime, you usually can't hold out for very long, which takes us to the bottom chart. Whether through a manual or automated process, we often have to resort to raising the cap. While this relieves the pressure on our applications, it may establish a new peak rolling four hour average for that month. There's really no point in putting the cap back down as a software bill is based on the highest peak. We think there's a better way. This chart shows the same data as before, but includes the consumption broken down by workload. Note that the rolling four hour average is a single value shown with the blue line. The rolling four hour average does not discern which applications contributed. An MSU is an MSU. So if we can reduce the demand of any of these workloads, we will reduce our rolling four hour average and the resulting software bill. Now, if my teenage niece doesn't get her Facebook updates in seconds, the world as she knows it comes to a bitter end. Okay, that's a bit of a joke, but it's not far from reality in the data center. We simply cannot delay mobile or online transactions. If you don't serve your customers, someone else will. Similarly, we can't have highly paid support staff staring at their TSO screens. Batch is logically the best candidate for demand reduction. Firstly, batch workloads are a significant contributor to the rolling four-hour average. We've looked at data from all over the world, and there are very few instances where batch played no role. Secondly, while some batch may be critical, it tends to run in minutes or hours, not seconds. So some delay is acceptable, particularly when you consider the potential savings. Thirdly, there's no point in running a job when the machine is at maximum capacity. Lately, we've been doing a lot of processor cache analysis. And today's high-speed CPUs are more dependent on the time it takes to fetch the next instruction than the time it takes to process that instruction. A low-priority workload in an overloaded machine just makes things slower for everyone. Now, this chart was generated from actual customer data and only reflects the day shift, typically online prime time. While online is certainly the dominant contributor here, note that batch makes up a significant portion of the rolling four hour average. Even a modest reduction in batch consumption during these peaks can yield significant software savings while maintaining performance for your key workloads. Now since we're talking about tools, is demand reduction something we can do ourselves? WLM initiators are not designed to be sensitive to the rolling four hour average. Operators can manually start and stop or change the classes of JES initiators, or with individual jobs, they can manually hold and release or change service classes once jobs are in execution. The problem is the machines are just too fast. A WLM policy adjustment interval is every 10 seconds. It's virtually impossible for anyone to absorb all of the available statistics and goals, then decide on the appropriate actions that respect business needs, software costs, and hardware capabilities, then implement that plan before the next 10 second cycle changes everything. This is something that can only be accomplished with automation. Throughput Manager does all these things and more. Now I'm going to pass the mic back to Selby so he can explain how it all works. Thanks, John. Throughput Manager, or TM for short, is a ZOS system software product that manages and automates batch job workflow in a just two environment. It runs as a ZOS started task on each member of the JESplex and interfaces with just two and WLM. TM analyzes batch workload upon arrival for resource and job characteristics and provides extensive facilities to handle the resource requirements and scheduling of batch jobs based on installation provided rules and standards. TM manages the progress of batch workloads from input to end of execution. Some of its many benefits include automated workload balancing, optimal system loading, 
and lower software costs by reducing the rolling four-hour average. In order to balance batch workloads automatically, TM makes sure it is aware of the performance and capacity of the entire environment. It tracks the utilization of all LPARs and the required system and resource affinities of all batch workloads. The installation specified business priorities are defined to TM so that it always selects the most urgent job. Workload is balanced automatically because Throughput Manager controls the number of initiators on each system and dynamically spreads the workload across all members of the JESPLEX. Now, balancing is not simply making sure the same number of jobs are running on each system. Balancing means that each system in the JESPLEX runs the right amount of batch workload for the current conditions on each system while still respecting any specific system affinity and resource requirements of individual batch jobs. Throughput Manager considers the actual activity on each LPAR and reevaluates CPC, LPAR, and service class performance every 10 seconds so it can respond to environments that can and do change very rapidly. Only automation can do this. TM avoids overloading by rebalancing the batch workload as CPU demand and availability change. Capacity can change suddenly too, due to capacity on demand, LPAR weight changes, and soft capping. By balancing batch workload intelligently, Throughput Manager delivers increased throughput with proper use of existing resources. To avoid overloading, Throughput Manager only adds batch load when and where it makes sense. LPARs must have available capacity. This means either the LPARs are not using up their CPU entitlement by weight, or there are still unused CPC, CPU cycles on the CPC of which the LPAR is able to take advantage. The service class in which a job will run must be performing well to avoid unproductive overloading. The graph at the top left shows what happens when a system is overloaded. Elapsed time for all of the work increases dramatically, so all your batch jobs take longer, even though everything got started promptly. The key point here is that it is not important when a batch job starts, it's when it ends that matters. This is even truer with production applications, where one or more jobs may be dependent on the completion of another. Jobs end sooner in a TM-managed environment. We ran a benchmark in which over 1,000 jobs were submitted over several hours. These jobs had a mix of CPU and I.O. load and were run in WLM batch initiators and under TM. There were no job dependencies. The result? TM ran far fewer jobs at once, starting many fewer initiators, and completed much more work. The graph of the benchmark results is in the lower right. WLM started up to 300 initiators, while TM automatically started only 25 initiators. After over eight hours, Throughput Manager had completed 200 more jobs. The only reason it didn't get higher is that we stopped submitting work. These results would be even more dramatic with workloads that make use of job dependencies. Now, many installations use manually controlled just two initiators. In that environment, you will often find that the machine either is overloaded or underutilized, since it's just not possible to be as effective manually as automation that is constantly monitoring the environment, making decisions, and taking action. Sometimes less is more. By avoiding overloading, TM gets more batch jobs done faster. Overloading is much more likely in systems that are capped, which is why automation is so important when managing demand in a soft-capped environment. In order to reduce demand at the right times, Throughput Manager has to understand the environment and be aware of any changes that may occur. We've just talked about how TM is aware of factors such as CPC and LPAR utilization. In addition, TM is aware of any defined capacity or group capacity limits set by the installation and will detect any changes made to these limits. It also tracks the current rolling 4-hour average CPU usage for each LPAR and the current CPU demand, an important consider consideration when making decisions on whether or not to increase specific workloads. When reducing demand, 
TM analyzes this information plus the overall CPU consumption of the CPC and each LPAR, along with batch workload performance measurements so that the affected workload still performs as well as possible. TM constrains the batch workloads chosen by the installation in three phases. First of all, as the rolling 4 hour average increases and approaches the limit set by a defined capacity or group capacity limit, TM automatically starts restricting the CPU consumption by these workloads. It does this in five gradual steps. The idea is to slowly shrink usage and avoid hitting the limit with very high CPU consumption. As John has explained, we usually refer to this as hitting the wall. When you become soft capped at high rates of CPU utilization, this sudden drop in CPU availability can significantly affect performance. When this happens, this usually causes installations to immediately increase their limits and their software bills. By taking action in five steps before the limit is reached, Throughput Manager makes capping manageable and eliminates the negative performance effects. Then, while soft capping is occurring, TM continues to constrain the lower priority batch workloads to the maximum extent specified by the installation, reducing the overall CPU demand in each affected LPAR. This leaves more cycles available for high priority workloads such as online, even if the high and low priority work are on different LPARs. Once the peak passes, the LPAR is no longer being capped and overall CPU consumption begins to come down. Throughput Manager starts to smoothly remove the constraints on the affected batch workloads, gradually allowing more access to CPU, reversing the five steps that I just talked about. The goal is to automatically get as much of the deferred workload running as quickly as possible, as long as the rolling four-hour average is not increased, a difficult task without automation. Gradually, TM starts to run the deferred jobs. As long as the rolling four-hour average does not increase, the constraints will be relaxed further, and more of the deferred batch workload will be allowed to run. Throughput Manager also makes sure that the deferred work is selected at a rate that does not overload the LPAR. John? Thanks, Selby. You know, I've been doing this for a long time, but every time I hear them explain that, I learn something new, truly. Now, we're just going to have another brief pause uh, for Jen to launch the second poll. And this one's about batch. Again, your answers will uh, remain anonymous, and we'll keep the poll up for a little while while we continue. Okay. So as I was saying, as Selby described there, Throughput Manager complements your IBM toolkit. If you use defined or group capacity soft cap limits, Throughput Manager will automatically detect their presence and the value of the cap. By specifying at which levels you'd like to take action, Throughput Manager can dramatically reduce the impact of exceeding your chosen limit while holding the line on costs. If you include IBM's Capacity Provisioning Manager in your toolbox, Throughput Manager will complement that as well. Since both tools utilize your WLM Performance Index, Throughput Manager will reduce demand in busy environments, thus reducing the pressure on CPM to increase the cap. Again, holding the line on costs while protecting performance. Finally, if your business chooses not to cap at all, Throughput Manager can still help with your costs. By utilizing the same algorithms, Throughput Manager will automatically reduce workload demand to work towards your chosen MSU target. There's no risk of hitting the wall as there's no cap in place. Just choose your MSU value for each LPAR and decide how light or aggressive you'd like to be towards that goal. Your customized throughput manager policy will take care of the rest. Now to wrap up, let's look at a few practical examples. Here's an example of two LPARs in the same keck. On the left, before using Throughput Manager, we see that on LPAR 1, online and batch are both contributing 600 MSUs to the peak rolling four-hour average. On LPAR 2, online contributes 700 MSUs and batch 300. The total peak rolling four-hour average for the machine is 2,200 MSUs. After implementing TM, 
the installation decides that 25% of their batch should be eligible to be deferred. The results, the online usage remains the same, while the batch is smaller for a new total peak rolling four hour average of 1,975 MSUs, a savings of 225 MSUs per hour. The group limit can be reduced by 225 MSUs per hour without affecting online performance. In the second example, we have a different configuration. A group with two LPARs, one of which, LPAR 3, has mostly online, and a small amount of high priority batch that must run on that LPAR, and another LPAR that runs entirely batch load. On the left, before throughput manager, the peak rolling four hour average for this KEC was 1,850 MSUs per hour. Now this installation wants to reduce their peak monthly rolling four hour average, but they're also introducing a new application that is expected to increase transaction volume. I think it's fair to say that increasing CPU demand while reducing costs are generally conflicting goals. The installation identifies 300 MSUs of batch workload on LPAR 4 that can be deferred during peak times. They decide to reduce their group limit by 200 MSUs per hour and let the online work on LPAR 3 consume an additional 100 MSUs per hour. Note that the batch on LPAR 3 is all priority, so they chose to leave that alone. Their online applications got the capacity boost they needed, and they still reduced their peak monthly rolling four-hour average. Now, I just want to add that with Throughput Manager, both of these scenarios can work with or without soft caps, depending on your specific goals. Now, the example here is from an actual customer with a relatively low incremental MSU rate of $275 per hour. As you can see, the savings are substantial. These are ongoing monthly expenses directly off your software bill. Reducing demand works. Now, you might be wondering how Throughput Manager can help in your shop. If you send us your SMF data, we'll identify your rolling four hour average monthly peaks. We'll calculate the batch MSU contribution to those peaks. By then applying your installation MLC rate, you can easily determine your potential savings. You can then decide to put those MSUs directly into cost reduction or reprovision the capacity elsewhere. To recap, IBM includes a number of excellent tools with ZOS and we think they can be valuable additions to your capping and automation toolkit. We also believe that much more can be done and that Throughput Manager provides a unique set of abilities unlike anything else on the market. So check out our blog at throughputmanager.com for lots more insights on the page. We'll also be at IBM Z Systems Technical University in Dublin next month. We'll be at SHARE in Orlando this summer, at CMG in November down in San Antonio on the Riverwalk. Love it there. On behalf of Selby and all of us here at MVS Solutions, I'd like to thank IBM Systems Mag for hosting. Most of all, thanks to all of you for attending, particularly those across time zones. Uh, we hope you found our presentation to be both enjoyable and informative. But please don't go away. I'm going to pass the mic back to IBM and we'll be happy to take your questions. All right, great. Thank you so much. So we'll take a few minutes to answer some questions now. Again, if you have a question, you can use the Q&A panel on the right side of your screen to send it in and make sure it is sent to all panelists. Okay, um, first question here. Um, if the safety valve is used on the provision manager, does that raise the cap and thus the bill? It, uh, it can. Uh, what provisioning manager will do, and uh, Selby may want to add more after, but I'll, I'll start, is you provide a service class or set of service classes that you would like CPM to monitor, and you provide a performance index target that you would like to achieve. And if that target is not met, then CPM may raise the cap, because what it also does, which is part of what WLM always does when evaluating something that doesn't meet its goal, is it checks if the action will actually help that service class or not. So if it believes that it can, it would definitely take that action. Um, Selby, you got anything to add? Yes, a few things. Um, one is that 
you can specify to CPM how far it can go in, in upping a limit and also the size of each step. Um, the other thing to note is you also set the conditions for decreasing the limit back down to where it was. Um, so that what may happen is if you have a brief time where you're having performance issues uh, because of soft capping, it may briefly up the limit, allow you to get through that, and then put it back down. And it may be brief enough that it makes little or no difference to your, uh, to your final bill. Um, because we're dealing with a four-hour average, and if the limit is only up for 20 minutes, uh, the effect may be, may be quite small. And you are going to have to up it anyway. Um, part of the positive side of it, too, is that by having the limit down, if you don't need to up it, then you get all the benefits. And given that sometimes the load can be a little unpredictable and you might get a sudden surge or you might not, as I said, as we say, this is a safety valve and it's a great thing to have in place and you might not need it. Okay, I have a couple of questions about um, JES 3. So does Throughput Manager also work on JES 3? No, it does not. All right. Um, billing happens on a machine level, but capping will happen at the LPAR level. If there is a spike in some other LPAR, will that affect the rolling four-hour average? Yes, is the answer. Uh, the rolling four-hour average is calculated on each LPAR, but the SCRT uh, is at a machine level. So those are combined. Um, this is why Throughput Manager maintains awareness of all of the LPARs on a machine. Selby, uh, anything else to add there? That's one of the reasons why LPAR groups or uh, group capacity is such a good thing, because then you can balance it off and say, what's my limit? that I want for an entire set of LPARs. And if one is up, hopefully the other one is down. You can set a lower limit than try and set it, setting them individually. And also, with Throughput Manager in there, if the limit gets reached because of one system is pushing very hard and maybe it's the online, it will automatically, because that LPAR is part of a group on another LPAR, start reducing the batch load to try and keep you all within the limit. And as we said in the presentation, we do this ahead of time. So if we start putting on the brakes early enough, you may not even hit the limit. All right, what version or flavor of Throughput Manager is this capability delivered with? Uh, it's available in, in both of the, the current versions, which is uh, version six and the latest is version seven. So existing customers on version 6 can use it, and new customers will get version 7, and it's in both. Okay. okay. Is it possible to cap CPU um, percentage usage on an LPAR? Certain DB2 utilities consume DB2 rebuilds, for example, um, might consume all available CPU for a period of time, but some of our workloads um, is impacted if CPU usage exceeds 85%. Well, we're not going to cap, uh, certainly, a workload unless we're talking about a rolling four-hour average scenario, which is pricing. I think the scenario you're describing um, with CPU usage is a utilization scenario where a throughput manager would come into play there even without uh, using the automated capacity management function is we're not going to start additional workload when utilization gets very high because if DB2, which will absolutely be at a higher priority than batch, I would imagine, if DB2 is suffering, then batch at a lower priority will definitely be suffering. And if we find that the performance index of batch is not good, we will not add more work. Uh, Selby, you have any more there? Yeah, that's, that's really the thing. And then what happens automatically is jobs that can run elsewhere uh, in the JESplex will be picked up there where the performance is adequate. I'd also add that we don't rely solely on the performance index, but uh, other characteristics as well in determining how well a service class is doing. All right, here's another question. We soft cap a lot. We observe that when the soft cap is imposed, it takes WLM a while to adjust. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, and why don't you just talk to that one, Selby, because I think that speaks to the way you describe uh, group capacity working individually. Um, yeah, there's some of that. I, I, I'm not totally sure what the the uh, the person submitting the question is asking, but I think the bottom line is if they're talking about adjusting for things, that's why we do things ahead of time. I think what you're really describing is hitting the wall. And it takes a while to recover from that because you have loaded up the machine and you have an instantaneous rate that's much higher than uh, your limit. And then all of a sudden you start soft capping and all of that workload has to be squeezed into a, a smaller space. And WLM does take a while to sort out who should run and sh who shouldn't. And sometimes it's quite a fight. And uh, performance can be very choppy. Um, that's why we start ahead of time and we start reducing it so that you don't have as much running of the lower priority work. And it just it flattens out that curve. It means in general that you should cap for less time and the change will not be as dramatic, so there's not so much for WLM to recover from. Okay, are you aware of a way to see in real time the SDRT four hour rolling average versus just the individual LPAR uh, rolling four hour average? That's a good question. Uh, there's a number of ways to get at that. Uh, it is recorded literally within a control block every every five minutes on each LPAR. But what the uh, what you're referring to there by the SCRT rolling four hour average is the machine peak. Uh, that's one of the reasons in order to be more responsive, we calculate the rolling four hour average ourselves with throughput manager and you actually can display that at any time to see what the current rolling four hour average is. Yeah, you can see the, uh, we have commands you can issue that will show you the rolling four hour average on uh, each individual LPAR in the JESPLEX and it'll also show you the uh, uh, the rolling four hour average of the LPAR group, that, that LPAR where you issued the command, the one that it's on. And also it'll show you the uh, usage in the last five minutes so you get an idea about the trend. And it's all expressed in MSUs per hour. All right, managing batch is a continuing challenge. We are starting to isolate workload that does not require Kix, DB2, or WebSphere. Are there any tools in Throughput Manager that can analyze software stack requirements? So by software stack, I'm, I'm going to assume that the question is referring to uh, uh, software dependency, that is to say that this particular job needs to run where this DB2 or Kix application resides. Uh, so if I understand that correctly, uh, the answer is yes, absolutely. We have a, a function within Throughput Manager that we call binding that does not require any changes to your JCL. Uh, we can automatically detect where those subsystems reside and direct the batch uh, to those LPARs. And you can also, uh, as part of it, you could also decide to direct stuff away from there as well if it doesn't use anything that, that you recognize as having to go over there. Right, good point. So, which I think it kind of was part of that question too, which is how, how do I keep stuff away from there? Yeah, the you can yes, say, you you can say well. run anywhere but here. <laughs> yes. Okay, how does Throughput Manager have the ability to prioritize the batch workloads to ensure the high priority batch enters the queue first? Tell me you or me. Um, what happens here is that as all of the uh, batch jobs are come into the system, Throughput Manager analyzes them. And based on their characteristics and as set up by the installation, uh, it then understands what we call the batch importance or the business importance is. And then it puts all of the workload into a single queue and it also keeps in mind not only the business important, but the SLAs, because you also tell Throughput Manager your SLAs for the various uh, subsets of your work. It then orders this queue appropriately so that the most important thing that is, uh, has the tightest SLA is at the top. And what, what I just add there, uh, when Sylvie was saying come into the system, what we actually mean is when the job is first submitted, so uh, a, a WLM 
uh, importance isn't acquired until a job starts executing and you uh, go into a service class. We apply the business importance, which is set by you, the user. You customize that in your throughput manager policy for each job or group of jobs, and that immediately takes effect at submission. So while you're in the queue, before you even go into execution, you have an importance attached. And as Selby said, uh, the jobs are sorted in the order of importance, and that is constantly resorted as new work comes in. All right, is throughput manager limiting workloads all the time or only when the rolling four hour average is approaching the soft cap limit? Um, it's only doing it when you are approaching a limit. It, uh, and we do it as, as I talked about in five steps, but when you're not near the limit, it is not constraining it in any way at all. As a matter of fact, when it's not constrained, its goal is to run as much as possible without overloading. Okay, how does Throughput Manager handle user jobs peaking, which might have been submitted with a high priority class by mistake? Well, that's the beauty of the analysis, as we just talked about. Um, you will uh, very likely have set up user jobs uh, with a lower business importance than your production jobs within your throughput manager policy. So regardless of what the user may have coded, uh, our analysis is going to compare that job against your policy and say, ah, this actually doesn't get the priority that the user might have asked for, and it will be sorted uh, appropriately in the queue. Okay, um, if multiple service classes are missing their goals, does throughput manager consider the service class importance or velocity goals in its prioritiz prioritization of what gets started so that higher priority work gets started ahead of lower priority? What happens is that the, uh, this business importance gets translated at when the job actually starts up into a specific service class, a WLM service class. And so it, based on the definition of that service class, obviously you're probably going to set it up so that its uh, importance level is higher for those with higher business importance. And so therefore that does translate into it directly. Uh, throughput manager also knows how each service class is performing. Higher importance level service classes tend to be performing better and therefore throughput manager will be more likely to select work in them because of course in general WLM gives a higher important service classes preferential treatment and first access to CPU. Okay, um, can throughput manager deal with jobs that run for several hours? Oh, absolutely. We have actually customers that have jobs that run for days. Um, one of our great success stories is we had a very large customer whose uh, uh, whose uh, monthly, month-end batch run was, was running for five days, and just by running the default throughput manager policy without any capacity constraints, that was cut down to, to three days, just through our normal uh, loading algorithms. Um, what can also happen is if, this, if the long-running jobs are considered uh, uh, that they can be deferred in some manner uh, while you approach your soft cap limit, uh, throughput manager will change the service class if you have set things up this way. It's optional. It's uh, up to you and your uh, throughput manager policy. Um, and it will do it on the fly and start constraining them, and then when you're past the peak, it will let them run unconstrained again. And, and keep going. And of course, if these are not one of the ones that you want constrained, it will leave it alone. All right, does Throughput Manager tap into scheduling tools like CA7 to understand where a job is within its schedule? Tell the all yours. Um, yeah, we also offer a feature uh, called Production Control Services that is part of Throughput Manager that works with CA7 um, and is, is aware of all of the dependencies of the jobs and it also keeps history about how the jobs ran so it can predict how long a job will take and based on that it knows how, whether or not things are going to be late, 
how long they're going to take, and starts issuing automated alerts. There's, there's a lot of stuff, and it, it's, it's really beyond the scope of, of this webinar, but uh, the short answer is yes. All right, um, does configuring throughput manager to achieve one's goals, reducing MSU usage, for example, imply that you may need to change them by adding service classes or changing them? Yeah, what we recommend is that uh, you define uh, service classes to WLM, and how it works is instead of uh, your workloads, your jobs being classified through your WM classification rules, uh, Throughput Manager will make use of those multiple service classes and use your classification rules in the Throughput Manager policy, thus making changes on the fly as they'll be described based on the conditions in the machine and the demands of the business. Uh, you don't end up really with any extra active service classes typically. Um, if you are going to constrain load uh, using special service classes, uh, which is a popular technique um, based uh, to uh, in the soft capping scenario. Um, we usually have you define up to five new ones, but the important thing to note is only one of them is ever active at one time, so you're only adding one active period, which is negligible. And you don't have to define five, you could define three. For example. All right. Oh, go ahead. No, I'm done. Okay. Thank you. All right. Great. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for sharing your expertise with us today. Just a quick note that we will be sending out a link early next week to a recording of today's presentation to everyone on the call as well as um, to anyone who registered for the event but for whatever reason couldn't make it. So that concludes our webinar. I want to thank everyone for attending and have a great day.